All right, why don't we go ahead and get started. So thank you very much for joining. I'm Mark Lamonica. I look after the individual investor team from Morningstar here in Australia. Tonight, we're going to talk about ETFs. So we are starting our month-long four-webinar series on ETFs. So we'll give more of an overview today, and then we'll dive into some of the issues that we discuss a little bit today in the future. But before we get started, we have a couple of housekeeping items. So number one, anything you hear today is general advice. I don't know anything about you, so I can't offer personal advice. If you're over in New Zealand, you can get a copy of our FAP from our website, morningstar.com.au. And the New Zealand regulatory authorities would encourage you to speak to a financial advisor if you would like personal advice. But even with that warning, it would be great, of course, to get questions. You can put questions in the chat. You can put them in the Q&A section. And I'll get to those as I go along. And I'll leave some time, hopefully, at the end to answer anything else. Also, just so people know, this is being recorded so probably on Thursday, we will have a recording available. We'll put that up on our YouTube channel, but you can also email me with any questions, comments, or just asking for the recording link at mark.lamonica1 at morningstar.com. So that is the email address that is in the invite for this, uh, for this webinar. Okay, let's get started. You, of course, can listen to our podcast. You can follow us on Instagram. But today we're going to talk about investing in ETFs. So let's start with a very basic description. And a lot of this is what an ETF is not. And there's a reason for that, because I think there are some misnomers out there. But all an ETF is, is it's a collective investment vehicle, just like a managed fund that is listed. So that is the difference between an ETF and a managed fund. It's listed on an exchange. You can purchase and sell it just like a share through your broker. And it provides investors exposure to the underlying holdings that are within that ETF. Now, a couple of things that it's not, because I think people, and I think just with the popularity of ETFs, there are some, uh, as I said before, some misnomers about what an ETF is. So it is not a separate asset class. So in no way would you say that, okay, I need to get exposure to an ETF, I'll invest in it. It's just getting you exposure to whatever is in it. There can be lots of things in it. It is not necessarily diversified. Some ETFs, a lot of ETFs are diversified, but there are some that are not diversified. So that's important to remember as well. It is not necessarily low cost. So there are some very low cost ETFs, and there are some where you pay a lot more. So particularly actively managed ETFs where managers in there selecting securities and some of these thematic ETFs are really capitalizing on a trend or investing theme that people are very excited about. They tend to have higher fees. As I said before, with that description of active, it is not necessarily an index fund. So there are, <laughs> there are, Rodney said, come on, you love your FANG ETF. Yeah, I'll talk about that one a little bit later. So it's not necessarily an index fund. So there are both active and passively managed ETFs, just like there are both actively and passively managed funds. So a passively managed ETF, of course, is following an index. Now, the definition of index can vary. But there are ones that, of course, managers are just going in and selecting. And it is not necessarily the best choice for every investor. So we're going to talk a lot today about how you should determine and things you can think about to determine whether an ETF is right for you or wrong for you. We kind of have this, and a lot of it's marketing driven, but once again, we have this view, a lot of investors have a view that an ETF is perfect for everyone. All right. So we do have a question already, which is pertinent. What's the difference between active and passive funds? So very simply, an active fund is a fund where someone so a person or something, it can be a quantitatively managed fund where a computer is going to select what goes in there, but someone is picking what goes into that ETF, what to buy and sell for that ETF. Whereas a passively managed fund is following an index. Now, I will say an index like the ASX 200, for example. Now, I will say the lines blur a little bit here because there are some indexes like the FANG ETF that Rodney mentioned in his question. There are some indexes that are almost actively managed if there's a committee, committee of people that are picking what goes in it. But when we talk about a traditional and a classic passively managed ETF, 
it is one of these broad indexes that does have criteria, but that criteria is often based on something like how big a company is. So for example, the ASX 200 is the 200 biggest companies in Australia. So while that does change time to time as companies get bigger and smaller, it is still based on a set of rules and doesn't change that much. So that is, uh, that is hopefully helpful, but ask another question if you need a follow-up one. All right. We're going to spend some time talking about the pros and cons of ETFs. But before we go into any of those specifics, we really need to say once again, and something that I repeat a lot, is with any investment product, whether that's an individual share or bond or an ETF or a fund or a lick or anything else you can think of, really it's not so much the inherent qualities of that vehicle, which an ETF is, but it's really the way they fit into the way that you invest in your goals. So ETFs, as I said before, may be right for you. They may not be right for you. But that's all really about the approach you're taking to investing and what you are trying to achieve. But we are going to spend some time talking about some of the qualities in ETFs and particularly the way they've been marketed and how popular they are with investors that can, as I say in here, exasperate the negative tendencies of investors. And those negative tendencies are things that a lot of investors do that ultimately hurt their returns and ultimately make it harder to achieve goals. And prime among those things is overtrading and chasing performance or something popular, the next big thing, those often go hand in hand. So we need to be careful about ETFs because of that. So once again, like use correctly, an ETF can be a fantastic investment. Use the wrong way, it can certainly be detrimental to what you're trying to achieve. So let's talk a little bit about that before we get into the specifics. So this older gentleman who has since passed away, unfortunately, that is John Bogle. So John Bogle founded Vanguard. So Vanguard's one of the largest asset managers in the world. And Vanguard, although they do have a lot of active funds, Vanguard really popularized and commercialized this notion of index investing. So once again, following an index. And the theory behind following an index is number one, that it's low cost and that fees are very detrimental to investors. Number two is that a lot of active managers, active, um, now ETF, but at the time, active fund managers were not actually beating the index associated with that fund over the long term. And so index investing became very popular originally in managed funds. And once again, that's Vanguard that really popularized those, but there's a lot of other large asset managers out of index funds as well. But John Bogle was not wild about ETFs, which is interesting because Vanguard, of course, now is one of the largest ETF providers in the world. And really, his concern with ETFs was that because they are traded on exchanges, it makes it a lot easier for investors to, of course, trade them. And while that's part of the appeal about ETFs, particularly in Australia, where it can be difficult to access managed funds, the downside is just because you can do something easily often means that you do do it a lot. And of course, that's what I was referencing on the early, earlier slide, of course, the overtrading of ETFs. And there's this interesting UTS study that looked at performance of investors that use ETFs, and it was actually worse than investors who did not use ETFs. And the problem with that was around the timing of buys and sells. And this behavioral risk around ETFs is sort of inherent in the whole structure. And as I said before, overtrading and chasing performance, chasing the next hot thing can be really, really bad for you as an investor because you're most likely going to chase performance. And we do have something in investing that more times than not is actually true. And that's just reversion to the mean. So basically saying that things that perform very well in one period of time, maybe for one year, 
revert back to average. And so if you're continually going around and chasing those things that have performed well, you are going to have bad outcomes because of course to get back to average, they need to underperform. And so something that Bogle is very worried about in terms of ETFs, and that's kind of where that quote comes from up there, that if you're not focused on the long term, if you're not using this instrument and everything out there, right, whether it's an individual share or bond, whether it's an ETF or fund, everything out there is hopefully a just enabler for you to achieve your goals. But because of some of the because of the ability to trade ETFs, of course, people do it. So that's what Bogle was worried about. And that's what all of us should be worried about when we are looking at ETFs. That doesn't make you, in selecting an ETF, doesn't make you a good or bad investor. It's really your actions that you take with this. Um, so that is a definite con of ETFs and something that's not appreciated. So you always hear in all the marketing, you always hear from everybody who is championing the ETFs how easy it is to buy them. So just remember, that ease comes with a responsibility, and that responsibility is not to abuse the fact that there's very little friction to trade in and out of these. Just like any share, of course, that you buy as well. All right, so is an ETF right for you? Well, let's talk a little bit about that, because I think, once again, and this is partly because of sort of marketing and the aura around ETFs, but it's also because, um, because many investors just think that they don't need to worry about what they're actually trying to accomplish and everyone else is using an ETF and there's some huge inflows of ETFs, that that's the right thing to use as well. But let's talk a little bit about that. One of the problems with trading on an exchange is, of course, that you need to pay for that. So there are transaction fees, of course, associated with trading an ETF just like a share. Now, there are of course, a lot of low cost brokers right now. There are certainly ways to access ETFs without paying a fee. But if you're gonna go through a regular brokers, particularly one of the more expensive brokers, it can be a problem. So one of the first steps to look at if an ETF is right for you is think about the way that you're actually investing. So how often are you transacting? Now, this isn't necessarily buying and selling and trading in and out of them. But also just think about the natural way that we all generally save and invest. So a lot of us, of course, get a paycheck, and then we try to put a little bit of that paycheck away and save and invest that for the future. And what that means is is kind of constant contributions into your account. And then you're trying, of course, to take that money in your brokerage account, the cash you have in there, and get it into the market. But once again, remember, think about the transaction costs associated with it. Think about what you're paying in whatever way that you actually trade. And what we should think about is the percentage of the investment you are making that you are paying in transaction costs. And when we compare ETFs to something like a fund, many funds do not have straight out brokerage fees. So it is easier to get on a plan where you can slowly save and invest small amounts of money into a fund. Whereas with an ETF, of course, you are most likely going to pay for that. So I took an example, and it's a little bit of a short-term example, but there are two different costs that are associated with ETFs. So the first thing, of course, is the brokerage fee that you pay. Second thing is that bid-ask spread, which I think is probably not appreciated. And a bid-ask spread is, of course, just how you transact with any security that you buy on exchange, right? Basically, just like if you're going to change money at the airport and you see a price where they say, we'll buy it at this, we'll sell it at that, there's that spread. Well, that's really how the market and the market makers and everybody else makes money. So we got to remember that bid-ask spread as well. So here's my little example. So I went on Comsec, I look at their transaction fees. So it's 1995. Now I know Different people that use Comsec could have different fees. That's kind of their standard fee, $19.95 a trade. So let's say you have $1,000 and you want to invest it in ACDC. So ACDC is a band. ACDC is also an ETF around battery technology. Not a big fan of it, but that's just me. So let's say you got $1,000. You want to go and buy ACDC. You want to buy 
10 and a half shares for $94.62. You use ComSec, you pay that transaction fee. And then of course, because a lot of people trade ETFs a lot, you are of course selling it as well. So we're taking a round trip. That means a buy and a sell. So that's two times a transaction fee. And then I looked the other day and the bid ask spread was 20 cents per share. That means the difference between what a buyer pays and what a seller gets is 20 cents. And so, of course, if you're making a round trip and that bid ask spread stays that way, that's your cost for every share, 20 cents. So, in total, you're spending a little less than $40 in transaction fees, and you're spending $2.11 in bid ask spread. So, that's that 20 cents times 10 shares. So, that's 4.2% of your initial investment. So, it's important to put that into context because 4.2% is a lot. 4.2% is basically what you are in the hole automatically for by buying this ETF. And if we go back and look at market history and look at what the market has over the long term delivered for investors, kind of looking in the Aussie market between 9 and 10%. So if you're paying 4.2%, that's a good portion of that long term annual average return that we're getting. So just remember, you need to make that up. And so particularly people who are trading ETFs a lot, going in and out of them all the time, just remember that there's a cost associated with that. So kind of the big thing to look at with ETFs, and then we'll talk about types of ETFs in a second, but the big thing to look at is how are you actually investing and what are you paying to do that? Because there could be better options for you if you're investing relatively small amounts of money and paying these high from a percentage standpoint transaction fees. Now, of course, if it wasn't $1,000 and you were investing $25,000, of course, and I think there are different fees, frankly, for ComSec then, but of course, this amount, this you know, $42 would matter less. But still, something really important to remember, think about how you would invest and look at some different options. You can look at managed funds that have less of that behavioral risk because it's harder for you to, of course, um, transact in them so people do it less, right? So something that's important to think about. Um, we've got a couple of questions. So let me go through a couple of these questions first. Um, all right, so we've got a comment. This is a comment on what you said about ETFs not being in an asset class. I tried to use the Morningstar Investor Comparison Tool to compare an ETF with the managed fund, Platinum International versus BU. would not let me, gave me an error message. Um, I know you're not asking for a response, but yes, we should, we should enable that to compare, uh, to compare different ones. All right, so we've got an anonymous attendee that says, how safe are ETFs? I.e., can the ETF maker take the funds and not purchase the underlying asset? No, they cannot. So basically the way, and I'll do a quick description, but I can go into a longer one if people are interested. So the way anything works, the way an ETF works, the way a fund works is that the company does not actually get your money. So basically how this works is there are custodial banks. The custodial banks are charged with safekeeping. So when you buy an ETF, the quote unquote money goes to the custodial bank. The ETF company instructs the company, the custodial bank, in what to buy and sell. And so there's a separate entity. So if the ETF company went bankrupt, for example, the money is not with them. They don't have any of the money. So you cannot lose the money there. So the custodian bank has it. And custodian banks are very regulated um, to prevent, of course, them going out of business, just like any bank is. So there is a, there's no risk that you are going to, quote unquote, lose your money in terms of the ETF maker just walking off with it because they never actually have access to it. What they get out of an ETF, of course, is they get the management fee that you are charged. So the custodial bank will pay them that management fee periodically, and that's how they make money. They can't do anything with your assets. So hopefully that, uh, that helped. Um, is there counterparty risk with ETFs? So lots of risk questions. So Brian is answering that. So counterparty risk, of course, refers to the person or the entity that you are transacting with 
does not deliver what they're supposed to. So they could either not deliver the money. If you are going out there and they are buying shares from you, you send them the shares, they send you the money um, and vice versa. But no, there's also not risk there. So basically what they do is there's the notion of clearing around custodial banks. So what's actually happening is custodial banks are exchanging shares for money and there's a clearing house in between that that holds capital from everyone who's dealing with that clearing house. And they're the ones that won't hand over one of the two sides until both people have actually either paid or delivered the shares. Um, so that's a good question, Brian. Oh, we have lots of questions today. Um, let's see what else we have in here. Sorry, I thought it was a good place to pause for some questions. Um, so Phil saying, so when is a good time to buy an ETF? We will get to that. I think I hopefully answered how secure ETFs are. Um, all right, market makers is an interesting one. So what is a market maker? So a market maker is generally out there facilitating trading. So they are charged with keeping liquidity in the market. And so basically when we say liquidity, what we're looking for is when people are transacting shares, for example, on an exchange, you want the ability to sell your shares. You want the ability to buy shares. That's the whole point of a marketplace. It's like going to Kohl's and having all the aisles be empty. That's really not a great place to go shop. So the market maker is responsible for keeping that liquidity in there. So when you're saying market maker, the market maker is really working um, on sort of transactions with ETFs, but there's another mechanism involved also called authorized participants, not to get too technical here, but an authorized participant is around to make sure an ETF sticks very closely to its net asset value. So you've got all sorts of different um, entities that are involved in an ETF, um, but the market maker is trying to keep liquidity. And then an authorized participant is trying to make sure that that NAV and the ETF price. So basically what the assets are, the net asset value of the, let's say, shares in an ETF are very, very close to what it's trading for because you're trying to get exposure to those underlying assets. So Charles, ask again if I had not explained enough about it. Um, yeah, so we have a question from Dina. What about buying ETFs to hold long-term and not short-term by itself? How does this impact costs over time? Well, at the end of the day, it just becomes easier to make up those costs. So, you know, we're big proponents and I'm a big proponent of long-term investing for all sorts of reasons. It's very positive about ETFs. So that's why I'm saying that, you know, the fact that you can trade an ETF a lot means people do, unfortunately. And that's where that UTS study comes from. But certainly holding over the long term, of course, that allows that transaction cost that you paid for an ETF. Of course, it allows longer for you to make up, with, make up for that with market performance. So even if we sit there and say the market's going to go up 9% a year, well, 4.2% in this example is a huge part of that, right? But if you hold this for 10 years and you've made 9% a year for 10 years, all of a sudden that cost becomes an even smaller part of the ETF, uh, or sorry, of the total performance that you've gotten. So that's another reason we're proponents of long-term investor. Um, so James says, given the brokerage fees, if you had a long time horizon, would it be better to DCA? Um, so that's called dollar cost averaging or move into a position in one hit. All right. So let's talk about this. It's a big debate around investing. So dollar cost averaging basically means that and it sort of assumes that you have a lot of money and you're making a choice, right? So it's like, if I have $100,000 to invest, I can invest that in one hit, as James says, go out and put $100,000 into the market, or I could dollar cost average in, meaning over intervals of time, I would put maybe $10,000 each in. So partially, I think it's an interesting debate because many people don't have the option. So many of the proponents that like love dollar cost averaging invest like most of us invest when we get a paycheck and that gives us some money and then we take a portion of that money and invest. So they don't have that lump sum. But mathematically, if we look at dollar cost averaging and we look at moving money into a position at one time, mathematically, because the market 
mostly goes up in more years than not, it's better just to put it in in one lump sum. Now, the downside of that and why people get very nervous about it is, of course, the time that you put pick to put all that money in, the market could fall significantly afterwards, right? But average, on an average basis, the market goes up. So if we look at years, market goes up most years. Um, obviously, it didn't last year. But that's why mathematically, if you just had to pick a random time, you should go in and you should put the money in in one hit. But a lot of people in this debate don't have the money, right? They're just saving and investing like, like most of us. All right, do a couple more questions and then we'll uh, then I'll keep going. Um, does buying directly via Vanguard or beta shares reduce the issue you described in terms of reducing trading costs or there's still a cost with buying direct? Um, you're always going to have that kind of bid ass spread that you're going to have to deal with, but there are some low cost brokerage. There are some brokerage that is free. So it's really not so much about buying directly from Vanguard or beta shares. What's really about is how much they're charging. If you buy Vanguard, just because I know Vanguard, if you go buy a Vanguard ETF through Vanguard, I believe you don't pay any brokerage. So that is a situation where, of course, yes, it does reduce that brokerage you charge. But there are other places you can get free trade. So my brokerage account in the US, for example, all the trades are free. Um, so we haven't quite gotten there yet in Australia, but we've seen a lot of low cost brokers come in and charge a lot less. So I'm just saying be cognizant of that cost, especially if you're gonna put money into an ETF um, over and over and over again. Um, let's see, what else do we have? Uh, let me answer one question about the NAV. Um, yeah, let me, because we've got a couple questions about the NAV. So once again, a NAV is a net asset value. So a net asset value is what the underlying securities are worth within that ETF. So let's say an ETF, for simplicity's sake, let's say an ETF holds one share, just one company. So it holds a company that's worth $100. That is the net asset value then of that ETF. So what we're looking at is what is the price that the ETF is trading on the exchange versus that net asset value. So like anything else that trades on an exchange, the price is going to be driven by supply and demand, right? So if there are a lot of buyers in there for an ETF, you could see that price creep up slightly over the net asset value. Now, there's a mechanism in place to correct those differences. There's always going to be a little difference. But there's a mechanism in place. And really what it is, is if there is a lot of demand for an ETF, more ETF shares will be issued. So that's where this authorized participant comes in. Sorry, not to get too complicated, but basically these are companies that are creating more shares of that ETF. And I want to explain how exactly that happens because it's a little bit boring. But then if there are more sellers of the ETF than buyers, those same authorized participants will remove shares of the ETF to try to keep that equilibrium. And they mostly do it. Now, there can be small differences. The more popular an ETF is generally, and the more liquid an ETF is, if it's investing in really popular securities, it's generally a pretty small gap. But that's really when we can see these deviations. But an ETF is very different than a lick. So a lick is can have huge differences between NAV and price because there is no mechanism to keep those two together. Um, so hopefully that answered your question. All right, I'm gonna keep going and I'll get to more questions later. I've got nothing to do, it's Tuesday night, so I can stick around and answer them all, but hopefully we'll have time. All right, so let's talk about types of ETFs. And this is where I'm gonna get on my little high horse around uh, some of the ETFs, some thematic ETFs that I'm not wild about. So if we're looking at the core portion of our portfolio, and I'm not necessarily talking about a core satellite approach, although this plays into that as well. We're looking into the core portion of our portfolio. What we should look at in some of the best things about ETFs is something that's broadly diversified, something that is low cost, so you're not paying a lot in a management fee, and something that's representative. 
So it's representative of the asset class you're trying to get exposure to. And we're going to talk about this more in a second around building a portfolio around ETFs. So those are the ETFs that I like that Morningstar likes. And I put some examples, I threw some examples in there that have our analyst top ratings. So both gold and silver. Um, so gold, silver, bronze are the ETFs that our analysts really like. Then we've got neutral, and then we've got negative. So those are the ETFs that we like. Um, those are the ETFs that we think over the long term will benefit investors. But then we have sort of these non-core that should either be smaller parts of your portfolio or you should avoid them in total. And what we're talking about here is very narrowly focused ETFs. And you'll see kind of going through and just reading some of these names, you know, Asian technology tigers, video games and esports. That's that ACDC I was talking about, this battery tech and lithium, FANG, which is a disaster of an ETF that has 10 securities in. These very narrowly focused ETFs should not be a core part of your portfolio because you are, of course, and we believe this asymmetric risk reward and the costs are generally higher. So basically that means that the reward that we think you can get out of that ETF is not aligned with the risk. And the risk, of course, is looking at a very small portion of the market, given the costs that you're paying to do this, that we think those can be real issues for investors, particularly if they're allocating a lot of their portfolios. So the guidance that Morningstar would give, of course, is if you're going to invest in some of these ETFs, maybe they're right for dabbling around the edges. But that's certainly not necessary. And really, if you're looking to get exposure to something, look for some of these broadly diversified ETFs, whether they're active or passive. Um, they're really looking to get exposure to an asset class that you would like in your portfolio. And we'll talk about that in a second. All right, so how do you build a portfolio of ETFs? So we'll get into some specifics. Um, but first, let's talk about building a portfolio in general. And we've done a ton of webinars. I've done a ton of webinars on this. I'm not going to go through everything. If anyone wants those webinars, send me an email. I can send you them, sort of how to build a portfolio and the portfolio construction process. But it starts with you and what you're trying to achieve. So make sure... Or you're trying to figure out what kind of ETF to buy and you're all excited to rush out there and buy something, remember, define your goals. So where you want to go. If you don't know where you want to go. It's very hard to figure out how to get there. Figure out the return needed to get where you want to go. If you want a million dollars in 20 years, what return do you need to achieve to get that million dollars? Figure out your asset allocation. We're going to talk a lot about this with ETFs. So figure out an appropriate asset allocation because, of course, investing, different assets have different risk and return characteristics. You need a 10% return a year to achieve your goals, and you put all your money in a term deposit, you're not going to make it, right? That's why we need to take on more risk. We want to have assets that have more volatility where we expect to have higher returns. And then create an investment policy statement, which is just a plan. So really something that governs the strategy you're going to take. So start with those foundations. And once again, I can send information to anyone who wants to talk about that process. But let's talk about kind of the specifics about going through and picking ETFs and building a portfolio with ETFs. And we'll talk about how many, et cetera, later. But first, why are you buying an ETF? Remember, an ETF is not an asset class. An ETF is giving you experience exposure to a part of the market. It can be the whole market, be a very narrowly focused ETF, but it's giving you an exposure to something. So be very clear around what that exposure is you're trying to get. So an exposure could be, I want to invest in Australian shares, or I want to invest in global shares, or I want to invest in Australian bonds, et cetera. I don't need to keep going through the examples. But be very clear, first off, what you are trying to achieve. What is that exposure? What do you want to put into your portfolio? Now, there can be all sorts of different ways you can define this, uh, exposure. So it can be the asset class, which I just talked about. You could be trying to get exposure to a certain country or region. You could try to get exposure to what I'm calling economic status, so developed markets or developing markets. You could look for style. I want to invest in growth shares or value shares. You could look at size of companies. You could say, I want to invest in big companies, or I want to invest in little companies and factors. 
So you could want to invest, and we'll do a whole ETF, a whole ETF webinar this month on income investing, but you can say, I want to get income. So be very clear about it. And I think that this really helps with the portfolio construction process because you should also know why. That should be, I want to get exposure to Australian equities. Why? And then write that out. That can be part of your IPS. But start when you're thinking about picking individual ETFs for your portfolio, start there. And because number one, it will force you to think about what you're trying to achieve. And when you know what you're trying to achieve, then it's easier to find that ETF. We've had this huge, huge pro proliferation of new ETFs in Australia. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds are getting introduced all the time. And so you can be overwhelmed with choice, right? So start with what you're trying to achieve in terms of this ETF you're going to buy. Look at portfolio construction preferences. So I'll spend a minute on this. But remember, a lot of ETFs either are tracking an index or there is an active manager who is, has a specific goal in what he or she is trying to achieve with the ETF. Understand that. And it will actually be in the product disclosure statement. It will be in a lot of the other um, discussions around an active ETF saying what they're trying to achieve. So they may say, I'm investing in Australian equities. I will not allow one position to be higher than 5% of my portfolio. I am doing this. I'm doing that. So understand that can be portfolio construction constraints or guiding principles around an active manager. And then if we look at an index ETF, especially because indexes, and there's a lot of indexes now, understand how they're putting together that index, which the ETF is tracking. So the very easy example to talk about is a market cap, and I'll explain this in a second, a market cap weighted index versus an equal weighted index. A market cap weighted index, which is what a lot of the very famous indexes are, S&P 500, ASX 200, et cetera, means that the larger companies will have a larger percentage of that index. That's why in Australia, when we sit there and we look at the ASX 200, about 10% of it is BHP. And that's because BHP is a huge company compared to the other companies that trade in Australia. That's market cap weighted. More of the index goes to bigger companies. That's why if you look at a market cap weighted Australian index, it is dominated by miners and banks. So those are the biggest companies in Australia. So more money gets allocated versus an equal weighted index where an ASX 200 equal weighted index means the same amount goes into all 200 of those shares. So you would have half a percent of that ETF invested in BHP instead of 10%. And obviously those can make huge differences, but understand how those indexes are put together or understand the approach that that active manager is taking to build that portfolio, which you are buying with that ETF. All right, after we've done all that, and we've understood what we are trying to achieve, then you can start thinking about what, the ET what ETF is the best way to get you that exposure. Because remember, the ETF is not what you're buying, but the exposure you're getting, the thing that will drive your returns is, of course, what's held in it. So we got to understand, okay, well, how do we capture that exposure in the best way? So a couple of things you can look at is, of course, you should consider what's in the portfolio, as we talked about before. The index rules around things like rebalancing, the index rules around what it takes for something to come in and out, because that's going to impact you in the future. So that, of course, can drive, and we'll talk about this later, it can drive to distributions, which you pay taxes on. Um, management fees. Fees are huge. So if you have two ETFs that are the same, and this is obviously fairly obvious to everyone, they're exactly the same. Which one should you buy? Well, you should buy the one with the lower fee. Those fees, of course, are returns that you don't get because they take them away from returns. Tracking error. So tracking error refers to how closely the ETF is tracking the underlying index. Now, tracking error is something that not a lot of people think about, 
And people assume that it is somehow very easy to go out there and exactly track an index that's changing all the time with 200 shares or 500 shares like the S&P 500 or 1,500 shares like some of the MISCI global indexes. It's not that easy. Now, ETF companies have gotten very, very good at this. And tracking error is generally pretty minimum. But if you go out and look at, especially asset classes like fixed income, you look at small cap shares, asset classes that have less liquidity, you can get bigger tracking error. So it is something to check, especially if you're investing out in sort of different parts of the market. And liquidity matters as well. So same thing, if you're investing out in different parts of the market, that liquidity, how often those underlying assets trade, how often those shares trade, for example, can have an impact on the manager's ability to replicate what they're trying to do. Because frankly, if an index changes, and it's very difficult for me to go out there and source those shares because it's a micro cap, a tiny company that doesn't trade much and there aren't many shares, that's a problem. And so that's, of course, going to lead to more tracking error. So something important to think about. And then finally, at the end, when we're executing a trade. So we talk, and this isn't a lot about trading because hopefully you won't be doing it a lot. When you're actually going in and buying an ETF, there are two things to look at. Number one is market depth. So market depth just refers to how many buyers and sellers are there out there at different prices. Because remember, the way that the share market works and the way that an ETF market works is what happens if you're trying to buy something and there are no sellers? What happens? Well, the price keeps going up and the price goes up until somebody's willing to sell. So you won't sell for 50, Will you sell for 51? And eventually, you can get to a part where a point, and this is the way markets work, where there's that equilibrium, right? So think of this as a housing auction, right? So if there's one buyer that shows up at your housing auction, well, guess what? You're either taking that person's price or you're not selling your house. If there's 100 buyers out there bidding that up. That's going to move the price of the house up. Markets work in the same way. So check that market depth. And you can do that very easily if you go in and get a quote in any one of your brokers, they'll actually show what the depth is at each price point. So you're not going to see huge falls and sells, but it is something that's good to check. Now, some ETFs that are obscurely traded are never going to have that much depth. But it's something to go look at. Other things to avoid. Our analysts believe that the first 30 minutes of the trading day is not a great time to go buy an ETF. And the reason for that is those market makers that are facilitating the trading of ETFs, oftentimes, and they use a little uh, description of they're waking up, but there's a lot of things that are going on in the beginning of the day that can make it harder for them to provide that liquidity. And that liquidity is going to provide the depth in the markets to keep those buy-sell spreads narrow. So they think you should generally avoid that first 30 minutes of the day and also avoid if the market's bouncing around a ton during a day. That can make it harder for market makers to operate. So that's not a great day to buy ETFs. Of course, you're not going to go out there and trade them a lot. So hopefully this does not occur very much. All right, so let's talk about some considerations with building a portfolio. So Shawnee and I put out a Investing Compass episode. If you'd like a link to that, let me know. Build a portfolio with three ETFs. And we're going to talk about how many ETFs to put into your portfolio. And the answer is it depends, but you can certainly have too many. So there are benefits from simplicity. And the benefits of simplicity, as I've listed, listed here, number one, you have lower transaction costs because you're just buying less things, right? If you have a 10 ETF portfolio and you're out there constantly putting money in all of them, that's going to raise your transaction costs. So you can lower those. It's easier to maintain a portfolio that has less holdings in it. Now, this assumes, of course, that the ETFs, you want to be diversified. But you can be very diversified by just buying one ETF. As long as you're buying the right one, right? That's one of the benefits of these collective investment vehicles with a lot of different securities in it. So what that means is, of course, the less securities you have in here, the less you need to worry about things like rebalancing. 
because of course you're not trying to rebalance between 10 different ETFs, you're trying to rebalance between maybe two or three. You make it a lot easier and less costly to go through those rebalancings, which is when you wanna get your portfolio back into alignment with what you're trying to achieve from an asset allocation perspective. So one ETF did really well, one did really poorly, and this is shares, and this is bonds, your asset allocation would be off and you'd wanna rebalance. So if you make it easier to maintain it. We're gonna talk about overlap in a second, but one of the problems that people run into with ETFs, which we'll go into, is they just think, okay, diversification, I need to buy as many as possible. Well, you might be buying a bunch of things that have the same exposures in it. We'll walk through an example. So if you have a smaller portfolio with less ETFs, not smaller in terms of dollar size, but you have less ETFs, makes it less likely you're gonna go out there and buy lots of things that will actually do pretty similar to each other. You're less likely to pay high fees. The reason for that is if you take these very broad-based ETFs, the track indexes are generally cheaper. So you are less likely than if you have 25 ETFs in your portfolio and you own all these new things that they put out around thematic investing that esports is hot and crypto and everything that has come out in the past couple of years, try to capture this narrative that investors find appealing. You're also less likely to tinker with your portfolio. So if you own three ETFs in your portfolio, are you probably gonna trade a lot and switch them out? It's less likely. It's less likely than if you have 20 once again in your portfolio and you say, oh, I'm just gonna swap this one for that one. And then three months later, you just swap that one for that one. And all of a sudden you are tinkering a lot with it. And that's the behavioral risk as an investor, right? That's chasing returns. And we don't like it. So simplicity and whatever simplicity means to you Simplicity does have a lot of benefits. And remember, we can do that with ETFs, where we can't do that with individual shares because ETFs, most of them, are already diversified, right? So you don't need to diversify at the ETF level by own lots of different ETFs. You need to diversify at the underlying holdings area level because that's what you're actually buying and selling. So it does make it easier to diversify with less securities where you would crazy is the wrong word, but you wouldn't want to go out there and build a portfolio where you own only three shares in it and nothing else, right? That's not diversified. Um, so something to think about there. Let's talk a little bit about overlapping exposure. Now, I picked three different ETFs. So I'll tell you what they are. VGS is a Vanguard product that tracks the MISCI developed market index. So basically what this is, is it's all the developed markets in the world. It's an index that tracks that. NDQ, that tracks the NASDAQ. So the NASDAQ, of course, is, yes, XAU. Thank you, Rodney. The NASDAQ, of course, is a very technology-heavy index in the U.S. of American companies. IVV tracks the S&P 500, so the 500 largest companies in the U.S., now, it can be logical for somebody to sit there and think, okay, I want to hold all three of these ETFs in my portfolio. And the logic sort of goes as follows. Well, VGS, I want to invest globally. I don't just want to invest in the US. So this gives me global exposure. Technology is a really important part of the economy. Technology, of course, is someplace where you get well, generally very high margins and good things for an investor. So I want to be invested in technology. U.S. is a big economy, still the biggest economy in the world. I want exposure to the U.S. So you go buy these things. There are a couple of things to think about is that there is a lot of overlap between these. So VGS, where it will tell you you're investing in 27 odd countries in it. Well, 70% of it's in the U.S. Because this is a market cap weighted index, the U.S. market is worth comparatively a lot. So 70% in the US. NDQ, IVV, of course, are almost 100% in the US. So that's one problem. Next problem is we start thinking about sectors, right? So remember, you wanted to buy NDQ because you wanted exposure to technology. And it gives you exposure to technology, right? 47%. But remember that because you're investing in 
a U.S. led e, uh, ETF of BGS and the U.S. is very technology heavy, they're getting a really big exposure there too, over 19% in technology. And in the S&P 500, where we remove all those um, non-U.S. global countries, you're getting 24%. So just remember, you are, of course, getting a lot of exposure to similar sectors in all three of these. NASDAQ's obviously the heaviest, but remember, you're getting a lot of technology exposure just by investing in the S&P 500 or this MISCI Global Index. So you've got more overlap there. Okay, what kind of companies? So when we look at companies across a style perspective from value to growth, so cheapest companies, value, most expensive companies, growth. When we look at market capitalization, large companies, really big companies are worth a lot, and then very small companies, what are you getting? Well, once again, because VGS is dominated by the US, because the US is dominated by growth shares, and of course, they're all market cap weighted, you are getting big companies that are growth shares. Once again, the NASDAQ is an extreme, but just remember, in both these cases, you are heavily tilted towards growth. You are not getting any small or medium companies. A um, couple medium, as you can see, but not that much of an exposure. So that's an issue as well. So just remember that going out there once again and kind of filling in your portfolio with all these ETFs that sound okay just when you're talking about, oh, you know, I'll get some technology, I'll get some global. Go in and look at them and look at what that overlap is. And I did see a comment on the chat come over. You can do that um, with our portfolio manager tool, for example. So you can go in there and you can look at the overlap between different ETFs. There you go, Robbie says portfolio X-ray tool. And you can see these different exposures, but you can go in and individually look at the exposures in the ETF. So what I did, is once again, some more new start tool. I looked at this correlation matrix. So what this does is it goes back and it looks at past performance of these three ETFs that I mentioned. So this is BGS, this is NDQ, this is IVB. With correlation, a correlation of one means something will move in exactly the same way. So something goes up 10%, the other will go up 10%. So that's a perfect correlation. And of course, conversely, if we have a negative correlation, so if we have negative one, it means I'll move the exact opposite way, right? So then you're perfectly hedged and if you own two things, your portfolio doesn't move ever. One goes up 10%, the other goes down 10%, obviously assuming different allocations. So if we look at this, this 0.87, you know, pretty close to one is looking at this Vanguard Miski International ETF and the NASDAQ. We look at 0.90, that's the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ. So you get the point. These things are moving very, very similarly. So you're not getting a huge amount of different exposures, which is what we want to concentrate on with each, with each ETF. So, you know, think about that. Think about that when you're filling up your portfolio with lots of, lots of ETFs. All right. Saw a couple of questions come through. But we'll quickly go through these and we'll deep dive into these in upcoming sessions. One very important thing, if you're buying a bond ETF, remember, and I get this question all the time, an ETF and a bond, an individual bond you purchase are not the same thing. An ETF is a collection of bonds. And as a collection of bonds, you're constantly going to get bonds that mature and you're constantly going to get new bonds going in. Right, Because unlike a share, a share never goes away unless it goes bankrupt or unless it gets purchased by somebody. So companies operate in perpetuity unless, once again, they're bought or they go out of business. Bonds don't. Bonds have a maturity date. So many people, when they're investing in bonds, have that mindset. And the mindset is, unless there's a credit issue, unless the government or the company that, that's issuing the bond, unless they can't pay you back, that bond has a maturity. So it doesn't really matter to you if you're holding to maturity, what happens in between? If the price goes up, if the price goes down, it doesn't really matter because you'll get your principal back at the end. You will never get your principal back with a bond ETF. So in theory, 
a bond ETF can continue to go down. So this Vanguard Australian fixed interest ETF, uh, ticker symbol VAF, went down 11% last year. It could keep going down depending upon the interest rate environment we have. So something really important to remember, and I can provide some more information and will on that, but just remember they're different. Don't think like you're buying an individual bond. Remember, an ETF is different. Next thing to think about with ETFs, particularly around income, is a lot of people, and they're used to this from shares, you'll go look at a dividend that's been paid on a share in the past, and you will say, okay, well, it's more than likely that dividend will continue in the future. Now, that's not true, of course. A company can change its dividend policy. A company can suspend its dividend. It can lower its dividend. It can do all sorts of different things. It's very different with ETFs. ETFs do not get dividends. They get something called distribution. And that may sound like semantics, but that word is important. A distribution is not just income. They're also distributing capital gains to you. So a ETF is a pass-through vehicle. So what that means is if anything's bought or sold in that ETF, or bought in that ETF, or sorry, sold in that ETF, and there is a capital gain that it has gone up in price, what is going to happen? They are going to pass through that capital gain to you, and you pay taxes on it. So the example is this horrible ETF, the FANG Plus ETF, that has 10 securities in it. So June 30th, it paid out $0.68. Cents distribution. So that gives it a yield of 5.32%. So a lot of people would sit there and say, wow, that's really good. So this must be an income ETF because there's only trading at $12.77. However, if we look at the yield of the holdings, they're 0.16%. So what were you given with that 68 cents? You were given a capital gains distribution, which may not happen in the future, especially if markets have gone down I can bet all of you on here that this will not pay anywhere close to 68 cents because markets have gone down a lot since June 30th last year, obviously depending upon what happens until, um, until the end of financial year. But just remember, be careful about that. Look at the income generated by the underlying holdings. So it's a tool we have available at Morningstar. Look at that yield, not the distribution yield, because it can be really distorted especially for an ETF like FANG that rebalances all the time. So what are they doing? They're selling the winners. They're buying the losers. You sell the winners, you generate capital gains. So just remember that. So in an upward market, those winners that they're selling, they're uh, not going to get canceled out by, uh, by capital losses. So something important to remember. All right. So, it's not just a black screen. It's unfortunately me again. Um, I'm going to go through and answer some questions. So I do know that 6.58, I'll stick around until I finish answering all the questions that have come through. But anyone can send me an email, mark.lamonica1 at morningstar.com if you have any questions after this. Um, if you'd like the recording, if you'd like anything else, some of the tools I mentioned on Morningstar, I can send that to you. So please send that through. But I'll spend a couple minutes answering questions because there are a lot of them. Uh, let's see, where were you? Um, does the management fee vary for both active and passive funds? Which one is more costly? Active funds are generally more costly than passive funds because, of course, the people that are in there making the decisions get paid a lot. Um, so you generally have much higher fees with active funds. Um, so something to consider. And most active managers do not outperform the market when we take those fees into account over the long term. Some do, most don't. Um, all right, so Rodney says, uh, with the managed fund, I assume the quoted fund price, buy, sell, can drift significantly from the underlying NAV, unlike an ETF. Um, so a managed fund will not drift from the NAV. And the reason for that is the mechanism that you buy and sell a managed fund. So with a managed fund, you cannot transact during the day. You transact at the end of the day after the market closes. And so the fund will automatically issue more shares or take away shares based on the demand in there. Now, funds do need to hold some liquidity to meet those potential redemptions that come in, people that want their money back, but it will always trade at NAV, but that's why you can't trade during the day. That's why you have to wait until the end of the day and they calculate the NAV. 
The problem you run into is that if you try to sell a fund in the morning, so you go tell the fund company, I want to redeem this fund. I want to sell it, get my money back. You won't know the price that you're getting it until the end of the day when the trading day ends and they can total up the prices of all the security. So if the market falls significantly during the day, you could get a lot lower price um, than you might think you do. Um, so that's the issue with funds. Um, let's see, sorry, it's still going through. Um, what is the meaning of portfolio turnover? So really good question. So basically what portfolio turnover refers to is how often do the securities in that portfolio turn over? So if it's an actively managed ETF, for an example, portfolio turnover is based on the manager. So the manager buys and sells a lot the underlying securities. You have very high portfolio turnover. If they don't, you have very low. Depending upon the index you track, you could have very low portfolio turnover because the index doesn't change a lot. Um, so think indexes like the ASX 200, right? So maybe at some point, that's 200 biggest companies in Australia. Maybe at some point, the 201st biggest company in Australia becomes bigger than the 200th. That will happen occasionally. But for instance, BHP isn't leaving the portfolio anytime soon. So you'll get a little bit of turnover in those indexes, but a lot less. So that turnover will be a lot lower. Um, let's see. Uh, can a gold ETF be used to invest in a specific quantity of gold, say 10 ounces, and to take delivery of the physical gold? How does the manager fee get paid? Um, okay, so gold ETFs are interesting. So there are two different types of gold ETFs. So there are gold ETFs that hold physical gold. So that means that literally there's gold sitting in a vault somewhere that the ETF holds. And then there are gold ETFs that hold, and this goes true for any of these kind of commodities and precious metals. Then there are some that just do it off of futures contracts. So it depends. As an ETF holder, you are probably very unlikely, I would say you are not going to get physical delivery of gold you will be able to sell based on the price of the gold in there. You want physical delivery of gold, you can go out there and look at the futures markets, but you're probably gonna have a hard time doing that as an individual investor. Um, so, you know, you can't go out there and just get your gold distributed to you. Um, so hopefully that answers your question. Um, Brian, so Roddy says, I can see one downside of using just one or a very small number of ETFs. But over the long term, you need want to change your asset allocation, moving from young accumulator to older G accumulator could be a big cap gain to dramatically change over. Yeah, I mean, listen, you, you would have that problem, but assuming you are investing, remember, you don't have to sell your whole position. It's part of it. Assuming you're investing in hopefully a bunch of asset classes that continue to go up, you could have that problem even finding anything to sell. Um, you could have capital gains if you're a long-term investor. Um, can Aussie bank hybrid ETFs go down based on interest rates like you described for bonds? Yeah, absolutely. So Aussie bank hybrids. Um, so hybrid, of course, is a security mostly issued by banks, um, which has both fixed income and equity attributes. But yes, they can go down in price and they can go down in price based on interest rates. Now, generally, they don't go down as much as a bond because most hybrids are floating rate. So basically they adjust the interest that's paid out to you will adjust based on interest rate levels. So that means they have less interest rate risk. Whereas most bonds, most are fixed, which means they have a lot of interest rate risk. So bonds, when interest rates go up, bond prices go down and vice versa. Of course, if interest rates go down, bond prices go up. You're going to have less of that in a hybrid, but they still do move in price. Um, now, most hybrids are not that volatile, certainly compared to shares. Um, but yes, it's certainly a risk that those underlying ETFs will, uh, will change in price, or the underlying hybrids will change in price and the ETF will change in price, but they're generally not as volatile. Um, What is the best investment if you have capital losses, which can be used up? Um, so I'm not exactly sure what that question is. So basically, you can offset capital gains with capital losses 
Um, so the best investment is one that went up, right? That you wanted to sell. Um, and you can use those capital losses as an offset. I think that's what the question is. So yeah, I don't know any investment that goes up. If I knew investments that would only go up, then I probably wouldn't be doing this. I would be off in, who knows, maybe here. Um, all right, so we've got a couple more questions in the chat. Sorry, I know we've gone over. Um, let's see, sorry, I gotta find. Um, Uh, so the follow-up question from Charles, uh, if market price is kept at the value of net assets of the ETF, is it safe to buy or sell at market price? I mean, it depends what you mean by safe. Um, what that basically means is if you buy, it could still go up a lot in price, but you're just that smaller tracking error is good for you as an investor because ultimately you're trying to get exposure to an underlying asset. So you might as well match that asset. Right now, obviously, an ETF can trade at a slight premium and it can trade at a slight discount. If you're selling, a premium is a little bit better, right? If you're buying, your discount's a little bit better. Um, but yeah, it's, I wouldn't call it safe because, of course, yeah, there's underlying assets to go up and down. But what we're looking for with tracking error is just to minimize it because that shows that a good job is actually being done by the company running the ETF. Um, Uh, so Andrew says, by that rationale, would you also not recommend investing in a managed fund that invests in a niche? Um, yeah, there's no difference between a managed fund and an ETF. What I'm saying is that just be very careful that that shouldn't be a core part of your portfolio. Um, certainly, if there are, if you want to dabble around the edges, there could be the opportunity to get exposure to something. But just the worry that I have is that you know, there are a lot of these very specific, narrowly focused ETFs and funds that are often released to take part in some sort of trend that investors are very into. Generally, once something is conventional wisdom and people are very, very into it, that means that it could be overvalued and oftentimes is overvalued. And it can be a problem, right, with that reversion to the mean. So it's an issue that investors constantly confront, sort of chasing performance. And so the recommendation from us at Morningstar is always, hey, for the core part of your portfolio, focus on those broad exposures um, where we think the risk and return profile fits in a lot better for what most investors are looking for. Um, if an ETF manager finds that the fund is a dud and they realize that they will never reach their goals, how do they exit? And what happens to the investor? Well, they will close the ETF for fund. It happens a lot. And it particularly happens around some of these very niche ETFs and funds that are released, once again, in response to investor demand for a certain theme. So what basically happens is they close it and you get your money back. Um, so you'll get your money back at whatever the net asset value is. And uh, yeah. Funds closed. Um, so yes, that's what will happen. Uh, Lisa says, is it better to buy stocks directly from the global market or buy a local ETF that tracks the world market? Um, good question. So it depends kind of what you're trying to do. So of course, with buying individual shares, there are, of course, you then need to decide what you're going to buy and sell. Um, so yeah, it depends. So I think that what that would more go back into is you know, are buying individual shares right for you um, or is buying an ETF right for you? So, um, yeah, it's kind, of, uh, it's kind of up to you, Lisa. Um, so Andrew says, what about ETF quarterly distributions? They don't seem to be particularly predictable and consistent. So Andrew, hopefully I covered that. They are not predictable and consistent um, because of that capital gains components. Um, Andrew says, they're a portfolio manager tool that can assess the amount of overlap. Yep. Morningstar X-ray is Rodney answered. Thank you. Um, that correlation tool is available as well. Um, given rising interest rates, should bond ETFs be avoided even if you have a long-term time horizon? Um, it depends where you think interest rates are going to go. So one of the one of the things that's important when we talk about interest rates is in a rising interest rate environment, obviously bonds go down in price, but a lot of those bonds will of course be priced at where the market anticipates interest rates are gonna go. 
right? So remember the market's forward looking. So generally, and we see this stuff all the time in the news media, the market is pricing in an RBA cash rate of X by the end of the year. Well, that's what the bonds will be priced at. So it's sort of surprises that are more of a problem. So the problem that we've really had in the last year is remember Phil Blow was sitting around talking about how interest rates weren't going up for years. Well, that was priced into the market. And all of a sudden they started going up. And that's when bonds started falling. Um, so remember, it's forward looking, but it's, but it's still the absolute level of interest rates does matter. Um, so if they continue to climb, so obviously we got a, ri- a raise today, they continue to climb into the future, you're going to have, yeah, bonds are going to be a terrible investment. Um, if, they, if the RBA raises rates once more this year and they kind of sit there, then bonds will probably be okay for the rest of the year, right? Um, so it's kind of those unanticipated changes that, uh, that happened. Um, you had 100K to invest, and let's say you want ASX large companies. You say the top 10 companies in VLC and just bought the shares directly versus buying ETFs. You leave it 10 years. Gut feel, a better return. Obvious list of doing it directly, but you do get the benefit from internal ETF buy sell. Okay, so basically what we're sitting here, and many of these market cap weighted ETFs are dominated, particularly in Australia, which has a pretty narrow market. They're dominated by the biggest company. So as I said, 10% of the ASX 200 is BHP. Right, BHP is going to have a huge influence on those returns. What I would say is the problem that you might run into if you decide that, okay, a lot of the assets are in the top 10, you go out there and buy those 10 shares. The problem you could run into is if one of those companies tremendously falls out of favor. Um, So just because something is in the top 10 now does not mean it's going to be the top 10 forever. So go back and look 10 years ago. well, 10 years ago probably isn't a good time, but look at transitions and kind of if you look at transitions, particularly around the US market, you know, in the past 20 years, which really moved from being very sort of industrial and traditional company heavy to technology company heavy. The problem you're going to have is you're not going to have exposure to all those new companies coming in. So it kind of depends what happens. But if we're sitting here 10 years from now and we're like, okay, what are the big companies in Australia? BHP, Westpac, Combank, like, so that same list, then yeah, you're going to get a lot of that exposure by buying those top 10 companies. Um, so March is how can I invest in an index fund instead of an ETF in Australia? Can I invest in an S&P 500 index fund um, in Australia? Yeah, so index funds are certainly available. It's a little bit more difficult to access them. They might have higher minimums for that initial investment, but then generally lower minimums um, for each contribution afterwards. Um, what I do is just explore, you know, if you look at some of the companies like Vanguard has a lot of, uh, has a lot of, um, index funds available, managed funds available as well, and sort of look at what the process is for going in and investing. And I bet you that they have both Australia and the U S, um, when buying ETFs over a long term, say 10 to 15 years, how do you keep track of the price from buying at all different prices? Example, the same four ETFs over 10 to 15 years. Um, it will generally be tracked by your broker. Um, number one, you could use your own tracking. Um, so very simply, you put in the transaction date, the transaction price, and, uh, and how many shares you bought. Put that into Excel. You calculate it yourself. Um, you could use something like ShareSight or another portfolio tracking tool um, to do that. So there are a couple of different ways to do that. But if you're using the same broker, they will track all that information for you. Um, so even if you're just like downloading your brokerage statements, you could, uh, you could have that. All right. I think, uh, I think we've reached the end. Uh, Uh, funds come with tax statements already prepared at the end of the year. Does the ETF investor need to prepare his or her own tax statement? Um, they will also issue. So Diana, uh, answer that. So they'll also do the same thing for you. Um, so it will generally just come through your broker. Um, is there an ETF for bank interest? There are cash ETFs. Um, so there are certainly ETFs that invest in very, very short-term securities. Um, so you can look those up. So there's a bunch of, I think literally, I think a beta shares product has ticker symbol cash, but yes, you can invest in cash ETFs as well. Um, just obviously be 
mindful of the fee. Um, will I share the slides or do we have to request a review? Send me an email, Anthony. Um, so the recording should be up on Thursday on our YouTube channel. But if you want the slides, send me an email. All right. I think we made it. We ran out of questions. So once again, we'll be doing three more of these during, uh, during um, what month is it? It's February. We'll be doing three more of these during February. We'll dive into some of these topics a little deeper. So hopefully you guys can tune into that. Sorry that this went 15 minutes over time, but thank you very much for joining and just shoot me an email if you have any questions. Any advice in this video is general advice or regulated financial advice under New Zealand law prepared by Morningstar Australasia Proprietary Limited and or Morningstar Research Limited without reference to your financial objectives, situation or needs. You should consider the advice in light of these matters and any relevant product disclosure statement before making any decision to invest. To obtain advice for your own situation, contact a financial advisor.